How many have ever had a perspective that branding like this creates ultimate value in the company? Mm -hmm. This is the foundational truth of a business. That's, that's why when we were talking about what's the passion that brings people on campus like this, when business and education come together, people prosper. Okay? That's the foundational element and vision. <coughs> Okay. So I just want to thank, of course, Kenneth again uh, for creating the foundation and a, a, certainly a raving fan in, in, in our group. Next, Bob Morrison, who is a valuation expert, <coughs> is going to speak to um, how does this all create value? Because there's a lot of things we are going to be talking about. There's a blitzkrieg of information that's all about building value. So ultimately, so ultimately, the greater purpose is we can help our companies and our people, but also create value enough for us to be able to exit our businesses at some point. Okay? So I'd like to welcome Bob Morrison, our valuation expert today. Thank you. Kind of capsulize something that Kennan said or for his, his thought process or what I guess the message he was trying to, to get across this morning. You know, my firm, we do business valuations and forensic accounting work. Um, there are a lot of accountants that do business valuation and forensic accounting. And once I realized that, once I found my higher purpose, I think I was able to start differentiating myself. And I'm a small firm, it's three of us. You know, so and most of you are small business owners. Yeah, and so, you know, as a, as a living example, once I realized what I was selling was a number crunching. What I was selling and what I provide my, my clients is credibility and I make them look good to their clients because my clients are attorneys and accountants. They're the ones who refer me into my work. They're the ones who sometimes actually hire me, estate planning attorneys, litigation attorneys. And once I realized that, that my higher life, what I really provide them is credibility and the comfort that they know if they refer me to one of their clients, they're going to look good. So my job is making my referral sources look really good. And so that's kind of how I conduct my business. Going to Ken's entire speech this morning, that's, that kind of brings home where I am in this whole thing. Now, the, the title of the, of the presentation is a bit misleading, false advertising. I'm not going to tell you what your business is worth. Um, that is a lengthier process than that roughly half an hour we're going to have here to talk about it. But I'm going to hopefully, if I give you one aha today, then I've done my job. And I think I know what that aha is. And, and it's going to subsume itself in, in an exercise we're going to do at the end of the presentation. But first, let's kind of let's talk about this. Um, when I go to a social gathering, and people find out that, that I value businesses, the first thing someone will say to me, well, what is my business worth? And so I tell them. It depends on a bunch of factors. Then they'll say, well, you know, I gross $10 million a year. Can you give me a ballpark? I say, sure. Wrigley, that's a ballpark. <laughs> I can't, just based on that, this is not a real estate appraisal. It isn't the, the science that real estate appraisals are. It's in our value in businesses. And it depends on a multitude of factors uh, that hopefully I'll impart on you today, and some of which you talked about last time in your last that's something y'all got together. One of the things you got to think about, though, who wants to eventually sell their business, either sell it or transition it you know, to family? I mean, that's the thing, <coughs> right? I mean, we all want to eventually go out and smell the roses and do other things, all right? So first, you've got to ask yourself, who's going to be the potential buyer? Who's the likely potential buyer? You've got an owner-operator, somebody who's buying a job. They're not buying a business. They're buying a job. Is that, your, is that your population of potential buyers for your business? Is that where you want your business to be? Second is a financial buyer, purely a buyer based on rate of return. A, 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 that will hire management or keep you in as management or do whatever and purely do it for a, a financial rate of return. The third would be like a peg, which is kind of a cross between financial and strategic buyer. And the fourth is a strategic buyer. A strategic buyer is someone uh, like a vertical integrator or horizontal integrator, consolidator, someone who can take one plus one and make three. Now, out of these four, which is one you think would pay the most for a business? 
the same business. Which of these four do you think would pay the most for the business? <coughs> strategic buyer. Because the strategic buyer, I'll use an example, um, a 10 ch uh, store restaurant chain in Central Florida, uh, and we got a national restaurant organization who hasn't penetrated Orlando yet and wants to penetrate Orlando. They can buy that 10 store chain and add no overhead whatsoever. They'll bring less costly capital to the table. Uh, they'll have other efficiency. They can squeeze margins somehow. And so by virtue of being who they are in a strategic buy, they can provide, they can pay a higher price. Now, not to say they're going to pay that to you because they're the ones who bring it to the table, but it certainly gives them an opportunity to pay more than perhaps an owner operator. So the first thing I think you want to think about is who is my potential buyer? Who are my potential buyers? And who do I want to be my potential buyers? And I think everyone would, would say, well, we want a strategic buyer because they're probably going to pay a little more. Well, are you really a strategic target at this point? And if you're not, then you need to get ready and move toward that being a strategic part, uh, being a strategic target. And that's something in perspective can help you do. And they can get you ready for that market. So then once you start talking about what is value, it's real simple. There's three variables to value. Profitability, growth, and risk. Those are the three key variables to value. Now, of course, in each of those is subsumed some concepts. But if you, can, if you can maximize your profitability, maximize your growth, and minimize your risk, you've got everything you need to do, end of day, go home, you're good. All right, just as an example, Let's take profitability. We've got two companies. Both companies are doing $10 million in revenue. <coughs> One has a 10% EBITDA, earnings before interest, taxes, depreciation, and amortization. The other has a 20% EBITDA. And you've heard in your industry that your company, companies in your industry are selling for 0.5 times revenue. That means that both of these companies, because they're both doing $10 million of revenue, would sell for $5 million, right? Would you pay $5 million for each of those? Or which would you be more willing to pay $5 million for? The profitable one. Because when you look at it, if, if the profitability on the first one is 10%, which generates a million dollars of EBITDA, and the profitability on the second one is 20%, which generates $2 million of EBITDA, on that $5 million purchase price, look at your rate of return. Doubles the rate of return. Okay, and so, those rules of thumb, oh, my industry, it's a half times uh, revenue, they're not as good as the paper they're written on because they really don't tell the story. The one that's more profitable would be worth more, and therefore, profitability is one of the variables. Second is growth. Two identical companies. Each of them are doing a million dollars of EBITDA. Company A is expecting 10% growth in earnings per year, let's say. Company B, flat. They, they maxed out their capacity. Uh, the, their, their fixed assets are old and aged and a significant investment to try to bring them back up to date. And so there's going to be flat or no growth. Now the market multiples three times EBITDA. Well, EBITDA for each of them is one million. So again, we got two companies that both say, oh, they're each worth $3 million. Again, which is more valuable? <coughs> the higher growth because there's more opportunity in the growth. And if you just look one year out, company A, because it's growing at 10%, ends up with 1.1 million in EBITDA on the 3 million acquisition, 37% return versus the flat growth, 33% uh, return. All right, so profitability, obviously, maybe not so obviously, impacts value, and growth expectation impacts value. And the other thing I'll say is, it's not what the growth has been in the past, and it's not what the profitability has been in the past. When you talk about value, one of the, the principles of value is the principle of future benefits. Value today is based on the expected future benefits. And so you may have grown 50% a year the last four or five years, but if you've maxed out and your growth going forward is perceived as limited, that's what's going to be bought, that future growth, not the historic growth. So the last area, and this is where I think people typically lose sight, and which I believe is the most determinative factor in value, and that's risk. 
In fact, I will say that I'm not a business appraiser. I'm a risk valuer. I'm a risk <coughs> assessor. Because risk, in my opinion, plays a much more important role in the value of your business than profitability or growth. And risk also, I think, is the one area that has the least amount of attention. And hopefully, as we go through this exercise we're going to be doing, you'll kind of see what I'm talking about and understand the risk of, that you're facing in your business. Risk return. This is a relationship between risk and return. I think everyone pretty much accepts that. We, we are risk-averse people. In other words, if we're going to take on more risk, we must have a higher rate of return. You are willing, if you don't want to have any risk whatsoever, you can get 2% all year long in a U.S. Treasury bond. If you want to invest in the S&P 500 companies, you're going to need a higher return because there are some risks associated with that. And so investors are risk averse, so there is a, a direct relationship between the risk and the return required on that risk. This is a bit of a busy schedule, so stay with me. But this hopefully gives you, uh, uh, in a picture, this concept. Think about this right here as, as a hierarchy of investments. You've got a risk-free investment, <coughs> which would be like a treasury. Then you've got stocks, S&P 500, for example. And the, that provides a return roughly 7 to 11% historically over the risk-free rate of 3 to 5%, or what we call a market risk premium of 4 to 6%. All right, why is there a market risk premium over a risk-free rate? Well, the risk-free rate's debt. The market is equity. Equity is riskier. Why? Because equity holders sit behind all vendors and all creditors uh, Center State Bank, you know, all, everybody like that. So, so the shareholder stands behind the debt. So there's this market risk premium just to hold equity. This is based on S&P 500. Who here believes they're an S&P 500 company? No one. Okay, well, so there's additional risk associated with your cash flow, with your expected cash flow, how an investor, how a buyer would look at your business and your cash flow. The next is industry risk premium. Different industries are riskier than others. Who can think of the, like the probably one of the riskiest industries that we have? Solar energy. Solar restaurants. energy. Restaurants. Restaurants aren't too bad. Biotech. Biotech. Construction is the construction is the riskiest based on uh, public data. Yeah, construction is the absolute riskiest. Uh, who can think of what would be the least risky industry? How about gold and silver? Companies that basically invest in or produce gold and silver. So that's the least risky. That's where this, these extremes are. Minus 3% is for gold and silver ores, and plus 6% is, is construction. Okay, so, so whatever industry you're in, you fall somewhere in that minus 3 to 6%, purely based on the industry you're in. So we've taken the risk-free rate, the market risk premium to have equity, the industry risk premium. Then there's this thing called size risk premium. And this is empirical data that has proven smaller companies are riskier. They don't have the, the depth to withstand a recession, global financial crisis. Uh, they are subject to more volatility in their, in their own operations. And so we now are adding to that size risk premium, which could be the largest S&P 500 companies minus 2% and the smallest S&P 500 companies 10%. So again, we're now up to 17 to 21% rate of return on equity for small S&P 500 companies in whatever industry, pick an industry. But we're not there yet. You as a company, you don't have, number one, you don't have uh, some of the resources and some of the, the factors that the S&P 500 companies have. And number two, these rates of return are based on actual stock transactions. And typically, those stocks of publicly traded companies are held in portfolios that diversify the risk. All right, and typically, I don't think you all own 100 to 200 different companies. 
And so you, have, you don't have that diversification. So we've got this other thing that's called company-specific risk premium. And in a second, we'll go through some of the things that are in that company-specific risk that, that have to be considered in determining this rate of return. So you can see that by the time we really get to closely held companies, you know, we're somewhere in the 20 to 30 percent or above. And I put the, the cap on this at 30 percent because that's about where venture capital money starts. You know, 30 percent to 100 percent even. Uh, and, and so you, you figure that your cost of capital, everything else being equal, your cost of equity is going to be between 20 to 30 percent. In other words, someone's going to require a 20 to 30 percent return from your company to buy your company. And as we talked about, as the risk increases, the return, required rate of return increases. So now we talked about the relationship between risk and return. Now we're going to talk about the relationship between return and value. And this is where it comes back to value. The higher that rate of return that's required, the lower the value. If, if, you, if, if your company looks like it can generate $100 a year in cash flow to the equity holders, if the, if the buyer requires a higher rate of return, that $100 is going to be worth less than a lower rate of return. So we have an inverse relationship between value and return. And all of this, this, this preface is because return is based on risk. The rate of return is based on risk. And when you look at the impact that a difference in the required rate of return, the magnitude of that impact is so much larger than a change in profitability or a change in growth, typical change in profitability and growth. Again, two companies, both have a million dollars of cash flow. Company A, because of the risk posture, is going to require a 15% return. Company B is going to require a 20% return. Look at the value differential. Because of the higher return requirement on company B, the value is less. So again, the, the risk feature, the risk component of this is important. Now, when you talk about the value of your business, I doubt you talk in terms of rates of return. You probably talk in terms of multiples of EBITDA or something like that, multiples of revenue. Multiples are an inverse of a rate of return. Multiples reflect profitability, growth, and risk. A company of higher risk is going to demand a lower multiple, period. Okay, so it, it, it relates back, ultimately because those multiples relate back to a rate of return. Risk, very important. So, you know, maybe the aha for you coming out of here is, I need to start focusing on some risk. Yeah, and, and what am I, what am I at risk for? Well, there's two kinds of risks. There's external risks and there are internal risks. And basically, the external risks, that's the economy, that's the industry. Those are things that you cannot change what's happening. It's coming your way. You couldn't stop the global uh, financial crisis. <coughs> but you could prepare for it just in case it happens. All right, so external risks are those things that are going to happen. And you go along with everybody else in your industry and in the economy. The only thing you can do is prepare for it, perhaps soften the blow. The internal risks, what we call the uh, unsystematic risks, these are unique to your company. These are things you can work on, that you can manage, that you can hopefully mitigate through some activities. And so let's, let's focus on some of these a little bit. All right, the, these are the external risks. Just kind of going, I'm not going to go through each one. <coughs> But you can see the types of external risks that, again, you know, to, the, to the extent that the Fed does raise the interest rate sometime, they've been threatening it for two years, you know, that's something that's going to happen. You can't stop them from happening. You can be prepared to the extent that your company is subject to changes in the interest rates, construction being one. When interest rates go up, construction activity goes down. You can't change the interest rate hike that's going to be coming. But you can prepare yourself in case it does come. And what you do, that's a, that's a, a business by business decision, how you, did, how you try to mitigate that. But the unsystematic risk or the internal risks, you can do something about. And I want to take a little bit of time going through these. You've got financial risk and you've got operating risk. 
Financial risk seems kind of obvious. What does your balance sheet look like? You know, is your balance sheet uh, sufficiently stable to, to allow you to grow and grow profitably in the future? All right, so that's something that you can, you can, your general financial condition, you can <coughs> have some control of that. You can do something about that. The nature of your underlying assets. Uh, who, which of you all believe that you are more intangible asset inten intensive versus tangible asset? Intangible. Okay. If you don't have a lot of real estate fixed assets on your balance sheet, all your value is in the intangible assets. And so, to the extent that you can and do what you do, have tangible assets, that helps mitigate some risk because you've got the tangible assets. But, the, but I forget the exact numbers, but back in the 60s, the value of businesses to their book value, to their tangible book value, was something like 1.5 to 1. Now, the tangible, it, it's like flipped over. It's like 0.5 to 1 because the value in business today is all intangible. My business, I got, I got a couple of computers, and that's it. The value is in all the intangible assets that I bring to the table. And, and um, a couple of you, when I heard the businesses that you're in, it's the same thing. The medical business, absolutely. It's, it's not the machines that you have in there. I mean, those have value. I know they cost a lot. Uh, but it's, it's the intangible value that you bring to it, All right? So the nature of the underlying assets will, will be a factor of risk. The leverage you use, the amount of leverage. The, most of the publicly traded companies, S&P 500, again, when you look at the amount of debt they have versus the total value of their capital, 20% or less is the average. Look at your balance sheet in terms of how much debt you have. You know, tip the, I see two things. It's either all debt, it's all credit card debt, or no debt because you're so risk averse you don't want to have any debt on the balance sheet. All right? But the amount of leverage, you, you can control that amount of leverage. The profitability, liquidity, those are things you need to your business. You know, are there things you can do to enhance your profitability? If you look at your profitability, we, we strive and we work hard to grow revenues. We all want to grow revenues. Do a little numerical um, exercise sometime. Look at if you grow your revenues 5% versus improving your margin 5%. Look at the difference that has. Yeah, if you improve your margin 5%, it, it's, it's ex exponential to the growth in revenues. Yeah, so you may want to focus on the margin, not necessarily on the top end. Uh, your liquidity, uh, Center State will tell you, one of the things they look at when they're either underwriting a loan or after they have a loan, they do their annual reviews is, can you pay the debt service? Can you pay the debt service? You know, it's my experience, you guys can correct me, it's not about collateral anymore, it's about, can you pay the debt service? Can you pay me when you're supposed to? Access to capital, a huge limiting factor to a closely held company is access to capital. Yeah, you've, got, you've got the best widget in the world. And it is just dynamo hum. And everybody wants more and more widgets. And you start running three shifts 24 hours a day, seven days a week. And they still want more. If you don't have access to capital, you maxed out. And you can't gr build another uh, factory. You can't grow anymore. You have reached your capacity. And so access to capital can be a, a severely limiting factor to the value of your business. Going over to the operating risk, and this is where we see this quite a bit, concentration of vendors, all your eggs in one basket. You, know, you rely on one primary vendor for it, whatever your input is into your, into your process. And that is incredibly risky, and buyers are going to look at that and say, that is just so much risk, I'm going to... I'm going to discount the value because what happens if, if you have a falling out with the vendor, if the vendor goes away, the vendor raises its prices. You know, so concentration of vendors, spread those vendors out to the extent you can. Have multiple sources of your vendors. Same on the other side, concentration of customers. Value the company and their, their sole customer was South Corporation. They did their, all their distribution. They had this huge warehouse and all their distribution. Southland sent a letter saying we're not going to renew the contract. 
company had to fold, and they liquidated. All the eggs in one basket, concentration of customers. Concentration of geography is hard to do in a closely held company. Now that's, you know, where you've got a national restaurant chain, you know, if there's a hurricane in Central Florida, there's a little blip. But if you've got a local restaurant chain just in Central Florida, when 2004 happens again, we get three hurricanes coming through, that's a big blip in business. Management depth. Um, I think Glenn <coughs> mentioned this as well, or somebody did this morning, management. So key, management depth. Buyers will come in and they'll look at that management depth. If there's one or two people in the entire company that know all the, the secret sauce, know how to make it, know how to bake it, that's terribly risky. Because what happens if something happens to one of those two people? And it's the same with reliance on key persons. You know, if there's reliance on one or two key people, and less protected, it could be devastating. And then finally, capacity, which we talked about. So, so here, are, these are some of the unsystematic risks. And then the last one is unprotected assets. I was going to abbreviate assets, but I thought I better not. Bada bing, they'll be here all week. Okay, uh, unprotected assets. <coughs> you know, you've got assets that are of value to you. If you take your business and break it down, you've got assets that are of value to you. Are they protected? Are you doing what you can? And this is going to be our exercise. And I'm going to have Jeff, before he starts, let me just throw something else out. Um, as David may tell you, uh, you all are closely held business owners. You probably have done, who's done some gifting of their shares? The only one? Okay. Um, well, if you plan to hold your business till you die, even, you'll have to file an estate tax return. Uh, if you want to gift to other family members or gift to others, you have to file a gift tax return. There's a, this concept that if you're gifting or if you're valuing a non-controlling interest, a non-marketable interest, non-controlling being under 50% and non-marketable because you can't call your broker up and say, sell my, my shares. We used to, we have access to discounts in value. You can move wealth. And, and Mr. Dietrich will probably expand on this too. Um, you can move wealth at, at a lower value because of these discounts. The IRS is attacking this right now. And what has been, people are saying is, is one of, will be the death of family run businesses because the transferring of businesses down through generations now is threatened because of legislation the IRS wants to pass uh, that basically ignores reality. And again, if, if you want to, David's probably more up to date on it than I am. I ask him when he does his, his session. Uh, but something to, to think about. If you're thinking about gifting, I'd do it this year um, because this may happen at the end of the year. So that was just kind of a, a separate thing. Uh, the exercise. Uh, Jeff's going to preview the exercise, and we're going to do it in groups, and then we're going to come back at the end of it and kind of put it all together. All right. Great. Thanks, Bob. Okay. I'm going to break up the room arbitrarily. These people are together. <laughs> These people together. These people together. And Jim, if you want to just jump jump over here. Okay, in this group here. Uh, our facilitators, <coughs> I'm going to ask you to tabulate on these stand up um, easels. So I'm going to pass these around. If you go to the exercise, Seth, I'm going to ask you to read the instruction. Oh, that's good. Okay. <laughs> While I'm is that because you know I don't know how to read? <laughs> <laughs> okay, Glenn, you you put this easel here. Okay. Uh, Gary, you want to do this over here? Okay. We just have a little bit of time here. The, the purpose of the exercise is to try to understand what your assets are and how to protect them. They're going to be a little different depending on your business, but hopefully you'll find some commonality when we're talking about these. Okay. I'm not here. No, we won't. All right, Seth. Go ahead, bud. All right. Rank the following assets in terms of contribution to the value of your business. Eight is the, eight is the greatest contributor, not ten. Eight is the greatest contributor. And one is the least, or let me make it like two and a half. Real and personal property, customer relationships, 
technology, trademark, trade name, brand, intellectual property, employees, business owners, personal reputation and goodwill, company general reputation and goodwill. So what are we taking somebody's business and doing this with or we're doing it with everyone's business? Well, each person is going to rank from one to eight. So there is a one that's least, and there was and there is an eight that is greatest. So each of you do that exercise on that on the uh, booklet there in front of you, and then the facilitator is going to add up the rankings of each owner. So if we have three owners in a group, we're going to have three columns, owner one, two, and three and their rankings of each. We're just going to total the top three major contributors to value. That, those are the issues. Yeah, so each of you rank one to eight, or eight to one, and then the facilitator will combine all that, and we will pick out of each group the three most valuable, like almost valuable assets, MBAs, um, of that group <coughs> by combining the scores. Yeah, but I, uh, my property is separate only for that. So that's not for our business. There's a question, there's a question um, that the, the, the real estate upon which the business operates is actually a separate entity, not part of the business. That's not, an, that's not an asset owned by the business. So in that case, it would be the least valuable because we're talking about just your core business. But it's still somewhat valuable to get it back. You don't want to use my business here before. But it would be a one. The, the question is, how would a buyer look at it? The buyer says, he still owns the property. Or so, uh, I'm going to have to pay extra for it then, for the, for the real estate. Bob, you got it. Oh, you got it. So, I would have had it. Okay. So yeah, keep, keep your tabulations close by because they're going to be important. Um, what, one of the things, one of the things I want you all to think about is this concept of goodwill. And I want you to think about there's there's this belief out there that you have tangible assets and you have goodwill, and that's not the case. You have other assets that are more than just goodwill. And this was this exercise hopefully brought some of those out. You have customer relationships, you have technology, you have a brand, a trademark and a brand, you have other intellectual property, patents or what have you, trade secrets, secret sauce, recipes, you have employees. You know, think about your employee base. What would it cost you to go out and redo your employee base right now? It would cost you money. You'd have to interview, you'd have to do background checks, you'd have to maybe relocate people, pay bonuses. You know, so there's value in those people being there, especially if they're, if they're skilled or professional. And then, then we finally get down to goodwill. So please don't think of your business assets as tangible and goodwill. You've got tangible, you've got identifiable, intangible assets, and then everything you can't account for then is goodwill. Okay, so think in terms of that. Now, the groups. Tell me the, your three top uh, most valuable assets. Our, our most valuable was customers. Okay. And then we had a tie between the employee workforce and the uh, business goodwill, corporate goodwill, the last one down there. Okay. okay. All right, great. This group. Uh, customers, IP, workforce. Okay. This group. <coughs> uh, customers, employees, and uh, company reputation. Okay. Hmm. Consistency. This group. Uh, customers, workforce, and owner, and business goodwill. Kind of goodwill asset. Business or owner? Business. Business? Okay. Mm. Wow. wow. Well, there's two of them now, okay. that's why I said it. They both said business. One said owner goodwill was me. So, <coughs> yeah. Um, as a group, I think it's fine. Interesting because we have a manufacturing company and we've got purely an intangible asset company. And it comes down to, with this group anyway, customer and employees. Now I'll tell you, there's what is a concept called the PICA, the primary income generating asset in a transaction. It's, a, it's accounting speak. Typically it's got to be customers or technology. 
employees employees are important, but they're not broken out separately for accounting purposes. So, but, but you hit it on the head. It, it's this is this is enlightening. Hmm. You know, how how often do you tell your employees that? I know. Show it to them. You know that, that they are one of your most valuable assets. Okay. So, um, what are, what would be the threat to customers? Give me some ideas of what what you come up with. What would be threats to customer to your, to your customer relationships? Lack of customer care. Lack of customer care. Lack lack of attentiveness. Right. And that comes from your employees. Yep. Right. Okay, from the employees. What else might be a threat to your customers? Competition. 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 Yeah, so let's take competition and just kind of put it aside here. Absolutely, that's a threat. Okay? Economy. The economy, right. The economy might be. There's some others that are right at home. There was a relationship with one of our employees. He leaves and he takes the customer. Bingo. Mm -hmm. Bingo. Where is that relationship? Really the same thing. I'm sorry? If not, everyone in the company is messaging the same thing to the customers. Right, absolutely, because you get a disconnect and that becomes dissatisfaction. But you, you may have a situation where there may be one or two people who control <coughs> those customer relationships yeah. or have the majority of the those customer relationships. And what have you done to protect that person, protect that from that person going next door to your competitor and taking those customers with you? What can you do? Non-competition, non right. A non-competition agreement, NCA. Yep. That, believe it or not, not only protects your employee asset, protects your employees from walking out, but also protects your customer base. <coughs> um, what else might you do to protect your customers? And I know some industries you can't do it, but how many of your customers do you work with under a contract versus just a PO system? Now, maybe your industry doesn't allow you to put them under contract, but again, think about it. You're a buyer, you're walking in, and the main customer is on a PO system, which means they could ship any dang time they wanted to, as opposed to walking in and my main customer's under a three-year contract. And guess what? They've renewed every time for the last billion years. All right? So you're protecting that customer relationship that way. So really, those are the two main ones with the, with the customer relationship. Um, well, well, we'll say three. Service clearly is, is number one. But then legally and contractually, number two would be a non-compete agreement with your employer uh, and um, uh, uh, contracts and you can get them under contract of some sort. Um, how many of you think, believe that you are the primary relationship with your customer or customers? <laughs> Seth does, okay. Me. Okay. All right. Okay. So you. So it's not your employees. It's you. Would you put yourself under non-compete for your own business? Have you done? I do have some non-compete employees. Yes. But where you're, you cannot compete. Where? Me? Yes, you. Why? Because I'm the owner of the business. Right. Okay. 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 Exactly. <laughs> you're the owner of the business. I, I'm walking in as a buyer. <clears throat> he can go compete anytime he wants to. And he has a primary relationship with the customers. There's no asset that protects the customer relationship. Right? So, so what I what do I do then? I make him sign a non-compete. And that has a lot of value because if he walks the customer walks. So that gets assigned a lot of the value of the transaction. Guess how much you're taxed on that? 39.6%. What's that? We can plan around that. I mean, I'm going to touch on mine since you touch on it, but you, you get into something called personal goodwill. Exactly. Where you, you basically say, okay, you have this asset of your goodwill and everything in your head going, hey, I've developed this thing. Me as a buyer, I'm going to come in and I'm going to buy that asset from you. And I'm going to pay you for that personal goodwill. Now, there's some forms you got to go through and what do you, there's a process you have to go through, but then you're on tax at 39.6, then you're at 23.8 which is a much better deal. And then, the, and then the buyer gets to amortize that over the 15 years. Mm -hmm. How do you do that? You pay, it over, you pay that out over a long but, period of time? No, you can pay it up front and go, yeah. Here, here's your half a million, billion. It really, it's all up front, they finance <laughs> and pay it. Right? So, so I'm, you know, I'm, I'm, salary, I'm, salary, I'm dealing, I'm dealing yeah. actually, it's a divorce right now. And the business sold for $60 million. I'll take it. 
<laughs> yeah, you can, you, can, you can tax me at 39. <laughs> exactly. If my wife does taxes, and she comes home and she says, oh, this client was mad at me because they had to pay more taxes, $10,000 more in taxes. I said, well, they made $30,000 more to have to pay $10,000, so I don't get it, and sure did get that whole lot of it. All right, so, so the business sold for $60 million. They were required to sign a non-compete, and it was valued at $10 million. Because the asset purchase agreement didn't say a thing about buying the personal goodwill, this individual is going to be taxed 60 of that, uh, 10 of the 60 is going to be taxed at 39.6%. And then the 50, which is the actual capital gain, is going to be 20, assuming no basis, 23.8%. There's tax law, and again, David can expound on it, but there's tax law that basically says one of the things you have to do is include in your asset purchase agreement. The buyer is buying personal goodwill. Then it slowly becomes how much is, is of the 60 million is personal goodwill, and it converts it to a capital asset from income. And so part, part of that process is also from Bob's standpoint, okay, get an evaluation on that. Add support to <coughs> personal goodwill and the documentation. So Bob would come in from an evaluation standpoint and say, okay, what is your goodwill? What, what, what's the value to you in this business? And then you can put a number to it, and that adds support. So, so just by adding personal goodwill, that triggers long-term capital gains? It gives you a better argument. It, it, at the end of the day, it's form and substance, but there's, I forget the exact case, but the case the, the tax court said, you didn't even mention personal goodwill in the asset purchase agreement or any of the documentation leading up to the transaction. So I'm not buying your argument now that, that, that they bought personal goodwill. Yeah. You have to put in a process, you have to put things in place, right. things have to be identified in the purchase agreement. Yeah. It's just not, yeah, it's personal goodwill, I'm going to report on my tax return. You know, you'll get disallowed on all of it. So mm -hmm. you have to put some thought behind it. Yeah. Um, okay. What? Question. Okay. So, so that way it kind of slipped into goodwill. Employees, what kinds of things can we do to keep the employees, to, to protect the employees, to protect that asset? We talked about one already, non-competes. Compensation package. Com yeah, that, the whole uh, corporate that's environment. Saying, that's saying in, in certain types of compensation. <laughs> yeah, that, yeah w whatever is necessary to keep them there, uh, keep them from going. Because remember, when a, when a valued employee walks out the door, the customer may go with it, trade secrets may go with it. You know, there's all kinds of other assets that might leak out that door. Buyers are funny people. Buyers will not pay for something that goes away when the owner walks out the door or it gets hit by a truck or somehow becomes incapacitated. They won't pay for that. And so the key is transitioning those assets to a corporate asset. One way of doing it is non-compete and taking personal goodwill and actually giving yourself a non-compete right now. That becomes an asset of the corporation. Yeah, as opposed to signing one when the buyer comes in because then you get taxed at, at that rate. Um, if you're, I would caution that with, is it a stock deal or is it an asset deal? And I'll get into that. It, it's a different answer when you put yourself on a non-compete. So you got to know where you're going and where you're going to exit before you do that. And so if it exits in your plan for the next five years or so, and just probably sit down and talk about well, it. Where do you foresee it going? What's the difference between, I thought I had the answer, but I don't. What's the difference between putting yourself on a non-compete now or just putting yourself on a non-compete when you, when they buy you? Yeah, um, the difference probably is, okay, now it's an asset of the company. Now you've kind of locked yourself in it. If you do it 10 years from now, that's still your personal asset and then you have more value out. But to me, the difference is, if you do it now before a transaction, that becomes an asset, and I'll defer to David, but then that's a capital asset. But then therefore, I think just on a selfish note, is if you do that and you have a partner and the deal doesn't go through, then you have no leverage. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. So put the partner on it too. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But then, yeah, then. They, yes. But but back to you, it's back to planning. Can, Where are you going and how do we plan for it? Yeah. That, that's what we need to look at. Yeah, and every one of your situations is going to be a little bit different, so there's not going to be an exact plan that fits. We just got to sit down and talk through what do you want to do and how do you want to get there, and then we can plan accordingly. Yeah, yeah. I'll tell you from doing valuations and litigation and doing it just simply 
for gift and estate tax purposes, the biggest mistake I see business owners make is not involving a tax professional and a legal professional in these transactions. Yeah. On, on that note, I'm going to tr transition it right to the attorney and to okay. the account. <laughs> <laughs>